department with a budget of something like $18 billion a year and 100,000 employees and ranges from tax to antitrust to criminal to civil rights to the INS to the FBI, the Bureau of Prisons, and a few ancillary other responsibilities of the department. And I, while I was working there, marveled at the uh, magnificent job that she and the Attorney General did in running those diverse responsibilities and in making the department a truly delightful place for me and some other people associated with the Duke faculty, Jeff Powell, Walter Dellinger, um, an opportunity to work there. Before working in the Justice Department, Jamie was General Counsel at the Department of Defense, and prior to that, positions of responsibility in the Department of Energy. And after she left Justice, she was Vice Chair of Fannie Mae uh, until three years ago? Four? Oh, one. One year. one year ago, when she left to join Wilmer Cutler and on the way assumed some small amount of responsibility with the 9-11 Commission, commission um, on which she was asked to serve um, and whose report was just completed this August. Um, a remarkable document, both in the sense that it achieved such unanimity of factual conclusions and recommendations among the Commission and in the readability of the final product. It uh, is worth your picking up and looking at uh, if you haven't already, both in terms of the true national significance of the contents of the document, uh, as well as just to convince yourself that it is possible to write a commission document that is actually readable at the end of the day. So J Jamie is going to talk to us uh, for 30 or so minutes, take some questions from you on the uh, report. Obviously can't talk about all of it, but on some of her reflections about uh, some significant components of it. So would you join me, please, in uh, welcoming Jamie Gorelick. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, all of you, for being here today. I'm actually awed by this uh, turnout, and thank you for being here and to hear me. Um, and thank you, Chris, for inviting me. I, one of the great, great pleasures of uh, working at the Department of Justice when I did was to have just fabulous uh, colleagues uh, like Chris and like Jeff to turn to when you had hard, hard issues. And what a luxury it was to have, uh, you know, as, as my lawyer, uh, Walter Dellinger uh, and, and the likes. It was a fabulous experience. But I'm here to talk to you today about the 9-11 Commission uh, and, its, and its report. Uh, we issued our report at the end of July, uh, and it's now got about a uh, million two copies in print and uh, lots of downloads from the website, and it's been received um, remarkably, I think, by the public and by uh, the policymaking community. And I thought I would talk a little bit about the process because it was kind of an interesting one and a, a little bit about our conclusions, our factual findings, and a little bit about our recommendations, and then, then turn to your questions, because I think that would actually be more interesting than me talking. Um, the 9-11 Commission uh, was appointed by um, partisans, uh, by the most partisan people in Washington, that is the leadership of the House and the Senate uh, and the President and the, the majority and the minority. Uh, in a very partisan time, I think most observers would say the most partisan time uh, in memory, uh, to address an issue of uh, national importance. And we took this responsibility very seriously and decided right at the very beginning to try to recapture that unity of purpose that the country felt on the evening of 9-11 and for the weeks and months following that, which unity of purpose appears to have largely disappeared, and we were trying to reclaim that in the interest of a unity of effort, which is what we think is necessary if we're going to uh, learn from what happened 
to the country before 9-11 and afterwards. The charge was simple. Look at everything that had happened before 9-11 to determine why we were unprepared. Assess what had happened since to make changes to make us safer and make recommendations uh, for the greater safety and security of the country. We were told to look at everything from our uh, immigration policy to our law enforcement policy to the practices of our military to the practices of our intelligence community. And we were told to do this in uh, 18 months, uh, start to finish, uh, with everybody getting security clearances, starting a, a complete operation, having um, such hearings as we wanted to have, and making a public report. Well, that was a pretty tall order, and we didn't quite make it in the 18 months. We did it in 20. Uh, but what we decided to do at the very beginning uh, was take a look at those, who, those commissions that had gone before us to learn the lessons from that. And the lessons were a couple. Number one, uh, you, you needed to have transparency. Because if you look at the Warren Commission report, if you look at the Pearl Harbor reports, they actually fostered more paranoia than they addressed. And uh, for most historians, I think people would say they were failures. Uh, uh, second, we wanted to acquit our responsibilities to the families who had lobbied hard and long to have a 9-11 commission to answer the question, how could this have happened to the strongest country on Earth, the supposedly most well-protected country on Earth, and at their urging to tell the nation how to make us, uh, how to make us safer. So we concluded uh, that we were going to have public hearings that we were going to try to put out as much of the story as we possibly could, um, and that we would make ourselves available to public questioning in the course of the deliberations, which was something which subjected us to quite a bit of criticism from those who said, you know, commissions are supposed to go away and do their work and come back and hand in their report, and then they're supposed to go away after that. Well, we haven't done any of that. We didn't, we didn't go away during the uh, preparation of the report, and we're not going away now, and that is endlessly frustrating to a lot of people. So be it. Um, we were uh, very pleased, uh, ultimately, to uh, be unanimous uh, in our factual conclusions and in our recommendations. And... Uh, you know, you all would know uh, from studying Brown versus Board of Education that there are some times in your history uh, and in your life when unanimity is really important, as long as you can come to it on the merits without sacrificing the truth or without sacrificing um, what your policy prescriptions might be. So that's a little bit about uh, the process. We had a staff of 80. We did our work in a room, well, in a suite of offices, but the commission worked in a room just about big enough for a table for us, which was essentially um, a skiff, that is a safe, uh, because the work that we did was uh, uh, involved highly classified information. And um, all of us spent way more time on it than I thought, than any of us thought we would at the outset. We had... Um, <coughs> 17 public hearings uh, we had uh, uh, which the st at which the staff presented to us their tentative uh, conclusions on the facts. But of course, we had worked on the development of those facts uh, ourselves. But having the staff present to us allowed us to uh, move off of their conclusions if we wanted to. Let me turn then to what we found. We found a high level of dysfunctionality almost across the government. We found that the FBI did not know what it itself had. The CIA and the FBI did not communicate with each other as well as they should have. The CIA did not communicate with itself as well as it should have. 
neither one communicated with the uh, State Department, that our military was still looking out rather than uh, thinking about a mission to protect us internally, that the FAA, which is supposed to uh, 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 protect civil aviation from attack, was almost entirely clueless as to what the intelligence community knew, that its uh, policy prescriptions and its procedures did not match up, therefore, against the threats. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but we can turn to some of them in response to questions. So um, the CIA had two of the conspirators in its sights at a meeting in Kuala Lumpur, where they were meeting, in fact, to plan these attacks. <coughs> and the CIA station in Kuala Lumpur followed Hamdi and Midhar to the airport, and they get on a plane to Bangkok, but the handoff from the CIA in Kuala Lumpur to the CIA in Bangkok fails, and they're lost in Bangkok. So one thing we said was, you know, there needed to be somebody back in Washington at headquarters who was following this, this and is making sure those kinds of handoffs happen. Second problem, the CIA did not know the, the, the full identities of these people that they were following. But they did not ask the National Security Agency, which is what owns those satellites up in the sky that suck up all kinds of communications, electronic communications, and analyze them, do you know who they are? Had they, they would have found out their actual identities. But they did not ask. And the NSA did not volunteer. The CIA did not look to find out that these people had visas to come to the United States until way late. When they finally did, they did not hand off to the Bureau to say, you're the domestic piece of this, go follow these guys. They did not tell the, the State Department, which has a list of people on its watch list who are not supposed to come into the United States because they are threatening our national security. So that's just one example of the places in which these agencies, none of whom had any legal barriers in communicating any of this, simply failed <coughs> to do their jobs in a sensible way. We were told right after 9-11 by the head of the CIA and the head of the FBI, we the public, <clears throat> that these people came in quote unquote clean, that the 19 hijackers did nothing that would have suggested that uh, they were anything but lawful visitors to this country. But that's not true. Their passports uh, were, uh, many of them were forged, and forged in ways which we knew, we somewhere in the government knew were connected to Al Qaeda. Um, their visas had evident contradictions on them. They were not filled out properly, and they had um, lies, which would have given rise to questions if they had been properly examined. Nine of the 19 hijackers turned up on uh, uh, a, a sort of screening and triggering list at our airports for additional scrutiny because of the ways they, way they purchased their tickets, because of the passports they were carrying, et cetera. And what was the remedy? What was the remedy? Well, the remedy for turning up on that list was that you had your, your bag screened, your checked bags screened. Well, these guys either didn't have checked bags or they were irrelevant because this plot was about taking over the airplane with knives and mace and pepper spray that were in their hand luggage. Had these airports and the FAA been on a higher level of alert, we would have screened their handbags, but they were not. So there was a mismatch between the systems that we had and the actions that were taken. And so folks who were identified moved right through. So we had layers and layers of protection, all of which failed save one, which were the passengers on Flight 93 who heard by calling loved ones, ones when their plane was hijacked that two planes had flown 
into the World Trade Center. And so those individuals knew that something was amiss and that their plane was going to be used as a missile, and they did what they needed to do, and that plane crashed in the fields of Pennsylvania. But our only effective line of attack were a group of Americans who improvised. In fact, the entire story of the day of 9-11 is improvisation. People who had systems and plans that were simply not made for this threat because they were not informed by the intelligence that we had in various places in the United States government, and who therefore <coughs> improvised their own <coughs> responses. One of the most startling, and to me as a veteran of the Defense Department, I served there twice, startling aspects of the story was where the hell was our military? We have a vast, sophisticated military. Now, I think if you ask most Americans, they would say one of its jobs is to protect us at home. In fact, we had almost no capacity protecting us at home. And this was brought home to us when we interviewed the pilots, who were indeed scrambled when FAA called NORAD, which is the entity within the Defense Department responsible for protecting our skies above us, and said, we have now lost two planes. They are, have disappeared from our radar because the hijackers turned off something called the transponder, which is what the FAA uses to uh, track them. And so we need pilots scrambled. So uh, two pilots who were at Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts go up in the air, but they're not told what they're looking for because the FAA doesn't know what they're looking for. They know they're missing planes, but that's all they know. We interviewed the pilots and we said, what did you think you were doing up there? And they said, we didn't know. We knew we were scrambled in response to a threat we thought the Russians got one by us. They were literally, they were literally still in a Cold War mentality. When most of us would have thought the Cold War was over a long time ago, and that that was not the threat that we should have been positioned against. And in fact, when you, when you ask the senior military witnesses why were you so blind to what was happening internally? They said we were positioned outward. We were positioned against a missile or a plane coming across the ocean. <coughs> we were not positioned internally. We left that to the FAA. And I think, and we said, that this was a default of our military's obligation to protect us. But there were many faults, and everyone, I think, who has been in government at any point in the last two decades um, share some blame in some way. Um, so we were sort of equal <laughs> opportunity blamers, if you will. Uh, I don't think you can read the report without concluding that we failed on many, many counts, including in the summer of 2001 when the threat level spiked but the government did not respond in a way that would have mobilized people to act. So, um, and that's the briefest of conclusions uh, that, I can, that I can give you, or summary of our conclusions that I can give you from what is, you know, a 600-page book with, I might add, 110,000 words of footnotes, uh, which if you put it, printed them in normal print would have been a 250-page to 300-page book on their own. Um, I do recommend reading the book, and even the footnotes are kind of fun, um, I think. Uh, uh, you know, I am in an academic institution here today. I would think you might like some footnotes, too, but um, there are some gems in there. Uh, so I'm giving you just the briefest summary of of what we laid out from uh, 
the history of Islam, albeit in an abbreviated, abbreviated fashion, the growth of Al-Qaeda, the, the beginnings of the plot, the actual implementation of the plot, and the various responses that are interspersed uh, on the part of our, of our government. This was the broadest, deepest look at our government ever. And we managed to put out, I think, more information about our government and its operations than you will find any place else. And so for those of you who are interested in the workings of government, uh, it's a good story, too. Our recommendations flow <laughs> from the problems we found. So we found there are 15 intelligence agencies who didn't talk to each other, who were not run by anybody, and who, when we confronted them with the problems, all went like this. They all pointed fingers at each other. Um, and to this day are arguing, you know, many of them are arguing against pieces of our report uh, by saying, well, we didn't do that. That was someone else's, someone else's job. We felt that there was a misallocation of resources where the military simply had first dibs on uh, our intelligence budget, leaving the human intelligence piece at the CIA uh, under, um, under-supported. And we made any number of procedural recommendations for fixing the problems that we found. But we have two sets of recommendations, one in Chapter 12 called What to Do, and the other in Chapter 13 called How to Do It. Now, all the attention is focused on the how to do it, and I'm delighted to answer your questions or take your comments on the how to do it. I want to spend a minute on the what to do, because if you read that section you, where we talk about our foreign policy, we talk about the, the way in which we are viewed in the Muslim world, we talk about uh, the fact that we have essentially unilaterally disarmed by failing to utilize tools like helping to build a competing educational system in the Muslim world to the one that is spewing out people who, who have no skills and are filled with hate. We have unilaterally disarmed by canceling programs that supported libraries and exchange programs and other windows into who America is and why its values are helpful and, and can be uh, important in the Muslim world. We are unilaterally, we have unilaterally disarmed by, in the words of our Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense of State, Dick Armitage, by exporting only our anger and our fears and not our hopes and our moral values. If you look back to the Cold War, which that pilot thought he was fighting, we used our moral stance in the world, our generosity, our values as important tools, not as substitutes for the military <coughs> tools, but as important tools in the tool chest. And so we lay out the full spectrum of tools that need to be used, and we say there needs to be someone in charge, a quarterback, someone in charge, to make sure that our policy reaches across the realm of uh, tools that we have and avenues that we have to address what is a multi-headed problem. Our recommendations have been received, I think, very well. The public, you know, we're on the bestseller list. We have been since we issued our report. Uh, that, you know, is not a goal in and of itself, but it's an important uh, aspect of achieving the goal, which is to move the policy needle. And, um, and certainly in the Senate, we have a bipartisan response to our report, which says fundamental changes need to happen. In the House and in the White House, somewhat less so, but some encouraging signs. Lots of rear guard action from the military that doesn't want to lose control of, the, of that intelligence budget. Uh, and we can talk about any of that as you wish. I would just say that on a personal level, however difficult uh, serving on the 9-11 panel was, it was personally rewarding. Uh, I felt that I was helping to do something that 
could make a real difference. I felt that I was um, helping to get the truth out, which um, can indeed set you free. Um, I enjoyed working in a bipartisan environment, and I hope that the example of our working in a, not, in a bipartisan environment might encourage others in Washington to do the same. And on that hopeful note, let me end my presentation to you and take your questions. Thank you. Chris, you want to call people, or would you like me to? How would you like to do this? I'll let you uh, solo it if you want to. All righty. All right. Yes. Yes, hi. Um, do you think that the war in Iraq has detracted from the work and recommendations of the 9-11 Commission? Um, we did not uh, take a position on the, on the war itself, but we did say uh, a couple of things. <laughs> One is we noted that, the, um, that we, are, we are still at risk in Afghanistan, where we shifted our attention from uh, finding the uh, sanctuaries of terrorists still there. Uh, and two, if we fail in, a, in a Iraq, having gone in there, we will have created the greatest sanctuary and the greatest failed state that there is anywhere of the failed states that we worry about, which is where there are havens for uh, uh, for uh, terrorists uh, to function. So that's about as far as we went, other than to say there was no connection between uh, Saddam Hussein and 9-11 and no operational relationship between um, Saddam Hussein and, uh, and Al-Qaeda. Uh, and that's what we have, uh, have said about it. But I think you can, you, know, you can draw your own conclusions when you look at uh, where we've been spending our time and energy and the vast array of things that we think need to be done and need to be done urgently to make our country safer. Yes? Well, I'm, I'm just kind of curious how come uh you guys did stay away from the Iraq war, and how come you didn't go into that? Is that, is that because you guys are bipartisan, and there's just a lot of you know, people who didn't want to really get out of the or is that because you guys really didn't thought it was outside your duty? Well, it was not part of our charter. I mean, you can imagine, we were we were stood up in, in December of 2002, and so the decisions about Iraq were <coughs> happening as we were in session, if you will, and so we considered it to be not part of our charter, and witness the fact that uh, Dick Clark um, surprised us with his testimony in public by, in his opening statement, saying he thought the worst possible thing that the president had done uh, in conducting the war on terror was to go into Iraq. We had never asked him about it because we considered it to be uh, to be out of bounds. To be fair, it would indeed have been um, divisive had we tried to take a position on the war in Iraq. And of course, there was another commission, the, WM, the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, that was put on specifically to look at. Yes? Um, you talked earlier about the, um, the things that need to be done to sort of repair relations with the Muslim world, undermine the ideologies of terrorism. Uh, you said something like ex foreign exchange and uh, setting up an education system there. I just wonder if you go into more detail about that. What, yes. what specifically are we to do to undermine that ideology? Well, let, let, me, let me set a predicate here, because there are really two problems that we identify. One is the very hardcore set of Al-Qaeda adherents, who, if you read bin Laden's writing, writings, are, um, in my view, and I think in our view, irretrievable. They don't view us as human beings worthy of any consideration. Uh, their view is that unless uh, the uh, Christian uh, world converts to uh, Islam, that we're infidels who, the rest of us are infidels who are killed. Um, and so really there's no dealing with them. But the second problem is the larger Muslim world in which our standing has simply hemorrhaged, simply hemorrhaged. And the fact is that uh, that breeds more terrorists, it emboldens uh, terrorists, it offers them sanctuary, and it is dangerous to us in, in actually more profound ways than the more uh, delineated threat. 
And so we have to do something to reverse that. Now, one of the things that you can do is offer a Pakistani uh, parent some alternative uh, when they want to educate their kid. Right now, they go to a school that teaches them nothing but hate and no skill. <clears throat> That's a pretty dynamite combination. And it wouldn't take much to incent countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and uh, Afghanistan to create a competing school system. It is simply inconceivable to me that the libraries that worked so well in the Cold War to offer people who had some curiosity about the rest of the world an opportunity to learn, and we've shut them down. <coughs> the same thing with scholarship programs and uh, other ways that we have of communicating. So public diplomacy is not just about you know, creating a, a, a satellite, our own satellite version of Algeria, Al Jazeera. It is about the message. It is about who we are. And it is about communicating our values. And what I just think this is critically important for us to do. People call it soft. You can call it whatever you want. We were uniform, Republican and Democrat, in agreement that this is a set of things we must do. Uh, yes, uh, in the first chapter of the book, we discuss when uh, Vice President Cheney uh, gives a directive to the military to shoot down planes, where he, the time it took for a batter to decide to hit a ball, he went ahead and gave that directive. He based it on an earlier conversation with the President. Did the Commission look at the constitutionality of the Vice President's authority of the military, and more importantly, in case of a future crisis, which we hope never happens? We were very critical of the failure of the chain of command in the morning of 9-11. <coughs> the president was basically incommunicado. He was up in Air Force One with communications that did not work, um, resorting to cell phones when touching down on the ground. Really uh, deplorable. Uh, you had the vice president in a bunker thinking that he was giving orders that were not being received. And he, th he thought he'd given an order to that pilot I just described. That pilot received no order. So, and in fact, after the fact, 10.30, the Vice President tells Secretary Rumsfeld, I have ordered plane shot down and three have already been shot down. <laughs> now, the last plane crashed at 10.03. <coughs> and at 10.30, you have the, the Vice President and the Secretary of Defense believing, talking about planes that had been shot down. When no orders had gotten to that guy who thinks he's looking for a Russian missile. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you continue on in the book, you will see that um, no one place uh, established what is called the National Command Authority. That is the communication between the President, those supposed to go from the President to the Secretary of Defense to the Commander on the ground. Secretary, the President's out of the loop. Vice President is acting in his stead, uh, purportedly on the basis of a conversation with the President. The Secretary of Defense is in his office. He, no one goes and gets the Secretary and says, Sir, you're in the National Command Authority. You have to come to the Military Command Center. You are in charge. Half an hour later, the Pentagon is in, he goes out to help people. And so, no one is in charge. The National Military Command Center, which is supposed to bring everyone together, could not get the FAA on the phone. The FAA did not have the military on the phone, and Dick Clark is over in the White House talking to all kinds of people, none of which are connecting the two who actually need to be talking to each other. We've got three phone calls, none of which are actually connecting the people who need to be talking to them. It was a complete disaster in the morning 9-11. Uh, in brief. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to compliment you on what was a very good read, and I applaud the commission's ability to communicate to the general public what really happened that day. My question is, your recommendations center mainly around what the government needs to do, but in my reading of the book, something that I thought was very apparent was that and very obvious, it was, it was civilians in charge that day. It was the New York Police Department and the New York Fire Department who took a really big role in trying to save lives and salvage what was left. Yet there's, there's not really any recommendations on how to bolster just civilian 
authority to, to help in these situations because it's clear that our military is very cumbersome, whereas these people are more agile and are able to help <coughs> in the area where it's a problem. But you know, the, the government's defense agencies and things are looking for bigger budgets. But what about these people who are actually in the trenches, so to speak? Well, I, we make a couple of observations that might be <coughs> of interest. Number one, we say, look, there are 50,000 federal law enforcement agency agents, there are almost a million <coughs> local law enforcement. They are the eyes and the ears, and that's why we do not recommend pulling the federal law enforcement piece out of the FBI and putting it together with the CIA, because it would break that connection with local law enforcement. Second, we say that the Department of Homeland Security needs to support police and firefighters, <coughs> and it needs to do it based on risk and not pork. Uh, and we have lots of specific recommendations on interoperable communications, on all kinds of things that first responders need to have. So there is actually, we agree with you, and we think, anyway, we made recommendations that address those concerns. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to get back to the point about you were making about exporting um, religion and kind of moral values to the Muslim world. Um, I see that you know, as a problem, uh, out of a, if you look at countries that are quote unquote allies um, in one way or another, in Pakistan, um, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, I mean, at their core, they are authoritarian regimes. Um, there is, you know, a few people in power that wield that power. Yeah. And education, um, of the kind that you're talking about, of giving people skills is something that I think would undermine that power eventually. Yeah. So how do you, you know, how do you educate the masses who are then going to eventually push for, you know, freedom, democracy, et cetera, et cetera, with these, <coughs> these you know, people who are in power who we're supposedly good buddies with, um, you know, who say, well, that's probably not a good idea from our outlook. This is a, so. you point out something that has been an historical tension in our foreign policy where we have by and large chosen to go with uh, the authoritarian regime and not, and while, while we have said democracy is important, not pushed it for fear of destabilizing regimes that were helpful to us. And we say that most explicitly with regard to the Saudi regime. Um, and we say that actually democracy is the only ultimate answer. Now, if you had democratic elections in Pakistan right now, <clears throat> what do you think would happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you would not like right. who you would get. And so uh, there is a real a, a real tension. But ultimately, you are going to get uh, powder kegs in each one of these places if you don't have some peaceful means of expression <laughs> by, by the people. It's just going to happen. Whether they're educated or not, it's going to happen. And so we say you've got to go down... Uh, that road. Now that doesn't mean we endorse uh, uh, going around the world and destabilizing regimes because they're not democratic. That's a lot to bite off. And that's one of the interesting, and this isn't part of the 9-11 report, but an interesting inter-party dispute you're having within the Republican Party right now about how messianic for, uh, should we be. Yes? Um, I have several questions that I relate to. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm just curious about how, why did you come up with the idea of starting the book, book with the history of Islam? And how do you think the 9-11 is related to the entire Islam rhetoric? And the second one is, um, I, I can't help but notice you're referring to Muslim world as one entire body. And Muslim world is extremely segmented within itself. And the gentleman just referred to a couple of countries that are authoritative. But there are those that have been, well, one I know, which is Turkey, <laughs> that has been democratic so far. And I think education, as far as it's important, it's not the only component. Um, another important thing about most of the Muslim world is is that it's mostly really poor. 
And when you leave such a big population so poor and so uneducated at the same time, it's and when they have nothing else to lose other than their lives, you can easily make them alive bombs. So it's I don't think it's only a discussion of education, and I don't think um, it's very often you find education <coughs> institutions in the Muslim world where they teach hate. I think it's it's a much bigger picture than only education. And plus, Al Qaeda, the, the rhetoric Al Qaeda uses has Islamic terminology, but I don't think it's Islamic rhetoric because Al Qaeda um, kills a lot of Muslim people <coughs> within the mo different parts of Muslim world. I would agree with John. Really, everything you said. I mean, there's a bit of a shorthand that uh, uh, is inevitable when I'm trying to uh, talk about recommendations that take 600 pages to, to write about uh, in a in a period of, of an hour. Uh, to so briefly to hit uh, some of the uh, key points. One, uh, uh, we understand that the Muslim world is not monolithic. Two, and we write about that. Two, we call the threat here uh, not a threat uh, from the Muslim world, but rather uh, a very specific threat, which is Islamist fundamentalist terrorists. And, and if you uh, read um, our, albeit brief, description of the um, roots of Al-Qaeda's and Bin Laden's ideology, it is a perverted, uh, it's a perversion of the, of, of the religion, and, 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 and you can see it. Uh, third, we are very much aware that uh, uh, um, of the frustrations that can be bred from a lack of hope. And so uh, the education piece is designed in part to give hope, but we also have a recommendation of, of, uh, for uh, uh, economic growth in, in the region, stemming from free trade and, and, other, uh, and other aspects that, I, you know, that are a little more cumbersome than I can get into uh, right here, but we would uh, agree with you. I just want to say one word about Turkey. <coughs> Turkey is our strongest ally in that part of the world. And if you look at the uh, Pew uh, data where they do polling, essentially, in all parts of the, of the world, uh, uh, after 9-11, including in the aftermath of our invasion of Afghanistan, <coughs> Um, the standing of the United States was very high in Turkey. The, uh, the approval rate for the U.S. and its policies were in, in well into the 60, into the 60 percent level. It's now at 15 percent in Turkey, and um, that's just not sustainable. Uh, that's just not sustainable uh, uh, for us, and we need to address it in some of the ways that I'm talking about here, and that we lay out at greater length in our report. So, yeah. What about some of the personal attacks that were leveled against you? Do you think that that was orchestrated as a way of discrediting the 9-11 Commission? And what did <coughs> former Senator Kerry and Governor King, what did they say to you when these attacks came out against you? Um, well, you should step down. Um, for those of you who could possibly have missed it, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, our, our Attorney General, uh, um, expecting a tough uh, hearing on the day that he testified, uh, came in and um, declassified a memo that I had signed in 1995 having to do with the conduct of, of two cases where there was a parallel criminal and intelligence uh, wiretapping operation on the same people. Um, and uh, said essentially I caused 9-11 by writing this. <laughs> and then uh, Rush Limbaugh and Fox News and uh, the entire very organized right wing of the Republican Party chimed in. It was, and it was perceived to be by, uh, uh, by the Commission, an attempt to undermine us. And a couple of things happened uh, which were quite gratifying, even if the whole thing was quite scary uh, to me. Uh, the first was, my initial instinct it was totally wrong, which was to call the Democratic leaders and get them to put out the truth and rally around me. Um, and in fact, Tom Kane came out of the hearing room into the ante room of the hearing room uh, right after uh, a congressman Sensenbrenner put out a press release calling me to resign, and said, "What are asked what, what are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm calling, you know, Lady Dashell." And he said, "Put the phone down." I said, "No." He said, "We're going to take care of this." 
And all of them, and particularly the Republicans, went out and said, we know a fact. This is completely wrong. This is an attempt to derail us. Now, that, you know, and they kept doing it over and over again. Uh, ultimately, um, you may recall that the, that the Attorney General then went marauding around in my documents and pulled out anything from that my tenure that might be that might build the case against me and put them up on the website, all the while, you know, not actually responding to the commission's real document request. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he did this on, uh, his timing was really awful, because he did it on the eve of our interview of the president and the vice president. Um, now, I don't know what actually happened here, but I do know that there were communications between the Republican members of the commission and the White House. And when we walked in <coughs> to the Oval Office that morning, the President said the first thing to out of his mouth, words out of his mouth were, I'm aware of the attacks on Commissioner Gorelick. I'm aware that these um, materials were uh, put on the website. I, I didn't know about it. I don't approve of it. And I'm going to make that known. And in fact, his uh, press secretary, Scott McClellan, did that right afterwards. And it went away. <coughs> but it was not fun. And it does give you a window into this uh, this uh, echo chamber of uh, talk shows and and uh, um, news outlets when it's coming uh, right at you. Uh, yes. A related question. I remember when that happened. I felt very unsafe because it showed the tremendous capacity that a single bad faith actor has to undermine a very necessary system that's keeping all of us alive. Um, and so my question is, how do you prevent a single bad faith actor, such as John Ashcroft, from undermining? <laughs> 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 well, let me, let me take the hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, you have to have checks and balances, and you can get out of whack. And it's just easier to get out of whack when you have a, uh, 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 a homogeneous government, you know, the control in one in one party, and you get out of whack when the news outlets um, um, are in you know in one set of uh, hands, and uh, other news outlets think that uh, covering the news is saying he said and she said, as opposed to actually making an assessment. So I think our press needs to have more backbone and actually look at, you know, you know, look at this memo. Did it do what he says it did? I mean, that, that, that I, I would have thought would be what the legitimate um, uh, press would do. I mean, in the end, um, the, you know, um, it depends on courageous acting uh, uh, on the part of, of public servants. Um, and I just hope we have an unending supply of courage. Uh, yes. <clears throat> this uh, question has to do with soft and hard strategies and their relative importance when your enemy is terrorism. Um, the classical strategy of terrorism is a soft political strategy. It involves hard tactics, spectacular attacks. But it's been, since it was first articulated in the 19th century in Russia as a political strategy, it's been a device of ideological recruitment. And the aim has been to induce a constituency to identify with the terrorists and regard them as standard bearers and as um, champions of its grievances, real or imagined, or some combination. It's been my impression that this is Al Qaeda's strategy, that they're interested in killing Americans, but ultimately they're interested in convincing Muslims to think of themselves in Al Qaeda's terms, with Al Qaeda's enemies and with Al Qaeda as the champions. Um, and it would seem to me that if this is true, it would be all the more reason to emphasize the sort of soft power um, opportunity creation and cultural and moral outreach that we talk about. So I, I guess I wonder whether it's the 9 11 Commission's view that this is Al Qaeda's strategy ultimately, and so that that's the ground where we need to meet. Yes, I, mean, I think that is Al Qaeda's strategy, and they are very good at combining um, attacks on us or other 
uh, elements of the Western world that they hate with a very sophisticated public affairs operation. I mean, we are being outcommunicated by a guy in cave. And they are uh, uh, utilizing every methodology, uh, including the most modern and sophisticated, to um, uh, uh, get the word out that we are uh, evil and they are righteous and that they are strong and we are weak. And those are powerful recruiting tools. Uh, let's see. Um, one more question? Oh boy, you want to call on somebody I haven't? Nope, you're doing great. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I have to live with these people. <laughs> um, I, I apologize, I've not yet read the, the report. I was wondering if... Apology uh, accepted. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if the report made any recommendations about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and sort of that, if it makes any policy recommendations. Uh, we don't, uh, but what we do say is this, um, uh, that we should not uh, 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 um, change policies that are otherwise right because it would uh, please or appease al-Qaeda. However, uh, we uh, also say that foreign policy decisions, including the, uh, whatever our role is in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict or the decision to invade Iraq or any of them have to be seen through the prism of how they are viewed and how they are utilized by an Al-Qaeda against us. And you have to anticipate it. So if, um, if you know, just to take an uh, example, let's go back to the Iraq example, if you, if you know that Bin Laden has said Americans want to kill and humiliate Muslims, uh, you're going to want to think through if you invade Iraq and if you do how you do it and what the possibilities might be for us looking not like liberators but like occupiers or worse. Uh, you might want to think through what your policies are with respect to the treatment of detainees for the same reason. And so uh, we don't take a position on you know, any number of uh, foreign policy issues, whether our troops should stay in Saudi Arabia or any of the other things that Bin Laden lists as, um, uh, as an element of his crusade. But we say we need to think about the perception and not, uh, and, and, and not be unaware of, of the uh, dangers of fulfilling Al-Qaeda's prophecies and predictions about so let me thank you all. These have been fabulous questions. I'm hugely impressed. And I want to thank uh, all of you who have read the report and those of you who are going to. <laughs> let, me, let me just say before we, before we break up, uh, I do think this commission document's a remarkable document, and the little bit of uh, discussion in response to questions about the environment in which it was created, I hope will make you understand that producing a bipartisan result was all the more remarkable, because it wasn't as if uh, the, the journey wasn't fraught with, with obstacles. And it must be in no small part due to the fact that the commissioners are remarkable people, and <laughs> and you in particular um, have been throughout your career a remarkable public servant, uh, which I want to give uh, personal testimony to once again as we close, having seen you work up close and personal and now in the work you've done on the commission. I'm not telling anybody how to vote, <laughs> but were there to be an administration that would look favorably upon an Attorney General Gorelick, I hope that you would all join me in writing that petition to that person after the election. So thank you very much.